Fontenoy, uh, 17, 1745, by Victus, a uh, folio game, um, the victories of Marshal de Saxe. Um, this is, this is from Napoleon. This is Napoleon writing. This is from Napoleon on the Art of War, selected, edited, and translated by J. Luvos under the uh, chapter under Army Organization. A great army can be formed only by stages. The organization should progress one step at a time. When a nation has no cadres or principle of military organization, it is very difficult for it to organize an army. If France in 1790 managed to raise good armies so promptly, it was only because it had a good foundation which the flight of the aristocrats improved rather than made worse. The organization of the armies of Louis XIV was vicious. Had today's organization existed at the Battle of Fontenoy, the maneuvers would not have been piecemeal. And when Turin declared that an army should not exceed 50,000 men, we must understand what he meant by army. In his day, an army was not organized by divisions. The commander had to, to direct everything. It was necessary for him to appoint generals to command the various units, and in such a case it is easy to understand why. If he was to see everything in front of him and command by himself, he feared confusion if he had more than 50,000 men. So, from the Allied side, uh, all of the formations and... Oh, I guess I should... All right, let's just say... I'm not sure about this, but um, first I thought all formations probably should have to, I think you have to try to activate them because, for example, you'd still be moving uh, routed units. So I went ahead and made sure, I mean, even though this uh, Campbell, um, English um, uh, commander here, is it English or British? <laughs> British, I guess. Brit British. Wait. Uh, yeah. Campbell here, uh, even though I didn't want to do anything with him, I still went ahead and uh, went through the activation process. Uh, they actually just missed it by one, so he would have been a failed activation attempt anyways. But I flipped him over, so one, two, forma two Dutch formations, two British formations, the independent unit here. I even flipped Cumberland, because he did move, made sense. But actually, I forgot about Moltke. This is my second of two independent units. Again, I'm not sure about this, but I'm going to go ahead and put an activated marker on him. Because I I didn't forget about him. I decided I'm still going to hold him back as a kind of, of reserve. But I guess I would still maybe put an activated marker on there. Um, would you want you? Well, I guess I'm going to see by experience whether that matters or not. Okay, so all the units have activated. Now we go on to the the overall step three for the first player's turn, and that's combat. So this should be all about combat. Um, units uh, of the active player may attack adjacent enemy units in their ZOC. Um, zone of control should just be front hexes. I'll double check that. Attack is not mandatory. That's interesting. The active player is called the attacker. Um, blah, blah, blah. You may only attack during the combat phase of the active player. That's us now. So it's the allies combat phase. So we have all of, we have this possible combat. Um, hmm. I have to remember he's disorganized though. We have possible combat here, here, but he's disorganized as well. And over here, um, disorganized cavalry, but uh, that formation commander with two cavalry units is is ready to go. So um, I, I think I had the question, can disorganized units still do normal combat? I believe they can because uh, only because there is a modifier here on the player aid. It's minus one if one of the attackers is disorganized. So I assume you can still attack disorganized. Um, let's see. When a stack of units attacks, oh, all of the units in the stack must attack the same enemy hex by combining their CPs. Okay. So all in, all in by hex or stack. Uh, unit or stack may attack several units at once as long as they are all adjacent and in the, in the attacker's zone of control. In this case, they are uh, attacked together by combining their CPs in defense. Okay, 
I believe that's the case where you have like uh, one attacker against two defenders. You can do that and yeah, and the modifiers are listed and written in such a way that that's, that that's okay. Um, several friendly units or, or stacks that are adjacent may attack the same enemy unit or stack by combining their attack factor as long as the enemy unit or stack is the only one in the attacker's zone of control. Oh, however friendly, several friendly units may not attack several enemy units in a single combat. The attacks must be resolved separately. A cavalry unit, we have cavalry adjacent, so let's see. A cavalry unit may not attack an enemy unit located in terrain that it could not move into. So let me see real quickly. Entrenchments. There it is. Um, fire, movement, entrenchments. Hmm. Oh. The, the cut trees. And of course the water. Rivers and ponds, obviously. Oh, nope. And cavalry and woods. Oh, that's significant. Oh, okay. So actually this is significant. Cavalry is not attacking in the wood, in woods. They're not attacking in obviously rivers or ponds. Um, and the cut trees or abati. Uh, this, this hat, uh, this little flecked pattern there. Okay. Um, all right. Mm. Ah, all right. Um, so camera, camera disturbance there. Um, <laughs> all right. I'm going to push forward on the simplest combats just so I don't get hung up on stuff. What, what I'm looking at is these two British, um, infantry units. I wanted them to combine together for total combat of 14, seven and seven against this one, French unit, but I don't think that that can be done at all because you have other units in the attacking unit's frontal hexes. Um, so that, so, but all that means is that they cannot combine. What I'm not sure of is, does that mean that this unit can attack this unit and separately, and then this unit can attack this unit? I don't see anything that prohibits that because I just looked and I don't find any you know, a unit or hex can only be attacked once per turn. But I'm going to skip all that. I'm just going to try my first basic combat here. So it's going to be uh, foot guards here. What's important here is the strength of seven, morale of six against the Swiss guard there. Guard of Swiss um, with strength of four, morale of five. Okay, so first of all, we do strength ratio seven to four, which is three to two, which is plus one. Um, plus one morale, a uh, difference uh, in morale. Uh, we have again, six and five. So it's one in the British uh, favor for another plus one. Facing, they're face to face, frontal hex to frontal hex. Um, there's no cavalry involved. Disorgan neither is disorganized. Terrain is, is clear, by the way. Clear terrain. Um, I guess it's just I guess it's just the defenders that matter right there. Clear terrain. Um, I'm not sure about that. I'm assuming it's only the defenders hex. Uh, light units. There are no light units involved. Again, I don't I don't readily see a light unit, but it, the light unit should have a clear L on it. But anyways, don't see one handy. No, still don't see one. Um, light units are, there's no artillery involved here. Change the order of, okay, this is a one unit stack to one unit stack. Um, I think that's it. So it's plus two for the British. Does that sound right? Um, that, okay, so it's an average three plus two for five. The, um, just real, real quickly, the uh, combat results table is the same type of list result with a final modified die roll. Um, actually, I can show it. So it's four or five is the attacker is going to take a morale check, and the defender is going to take a morale check plus one, which is bad. So morale check, morale check plus one. So we'll see what happens here. All right, so this is pretty basic. Uh, the British easily passed their morale check with a roll of one, um, but the um, French 
they would have failed with the five anyways, plus one die roll modifier of six. That is, oh no, I'm sorry, they would have passed their morale check because they have a morale five. It's equal to or less than to pass.